Anthony Casso, nicknamed Gaspipe, was an American mobster and underboss for the Lucchese crime family. During his career in organized crime, Casso was regarded as a homicidal maniac in the Italian-American mafia. He is suspected of having committed dozens of murders and had confessed to involvement in between 15 and 36 killings. Casso was born on May 21, 1942 in South Brooklyn, New York City, the youngest of three children. Casso's grandparents had immigrated to the United States from Campania, Italy in the 1890s. His godfather was Salvatore Calambrano, a made man and capo regime in the Genovese crime family, which maintained a powerful influence on the Brooklyn docks. Casso dropped out of school at 16 and got a job with his father as a longshoreman. In his youth, he became a crack shot, firing pistols at targets on a rooftop in which he and his friends used as a shooting range. Casso also made money shooting predatory hawks for pigeon keepers. Casso was a violent youth and a member of the infamous 1950s gang, the South Brooklyn Boys. In 1958, he was arrested after a rumble against Irish American gangsters. Casso later told Carlo that his father visited him at the police station and tried in vain to scare his son straight. He soon caught the eye of Christopher Christy Tick Frenari, the capo of the 19th Hole crew in the Lucchese family. Casso started his career in the Mafia as a loan shark. As a protege of Fenari, he was also involved in gambling and drug dealing. He was also arrested for attempted murder in 1961, but was acquitted when the alleged victim refused to identify him. In 1974, at age 32, he became a made man of the Lucchese family. Casso was assigned to Vincent Fosseri's crew that operated from 116th Street in Manhattan and from 14th Avenue in Brooklyn. Shortly after becoming made, Casso became close to another rising star in the family, Victor Amuso, and began a partnership that would last for two decades. They committed scores of crimes, including drug trafficking, burglary, and the murders of informants. Within Funari's 19th Hole crew, both Casso and Amuso led a burglary ring known as the Bypass Gang, which included expert locksmiths, safe crackers, and experts in security alarm systems. Authorities estimated the Bypass Gang stole more than $100 million from safety deposit boxes and vaults during the 70s and 80s. When Fenari was promoted to the Lucchese family's consigliere, he asked Casso to take over the 19th Hole crew. However, Casso declined, suggesting that Amuso be promoted instead. In December 1985, Casso was approached by Capo regime Frank DeChico regarding a planned coup in the Gambino crime family. Gambino Captain John Gotti, whose crew had worked with Casso in multiple drug deals and other captains, were planning to kill crime boss Paul Castellano. Gotti and DeChico were looking for support among the other four families affected by the Mafia Commission trial. According to Sammy Gravano, another of Gotti's co-conspirators, DeChico returned from the meeting saying that Casso had offered the conspirators his unconditional support. According to Casso, DeChico alleged during their meeting that Castellano's carelessness in allowing his own house to be bugged was reason enough to kill him. Casso later told Carlo, however, that he tried to talk to DeChico out of killing a boss without first asking for the commission's permission. Otherwise, he said, killing Castellano would be a cardinal violation of the rules and all the participants would have had to have been murdered by the other four families. Castellano's murder went ahead anyway on December 16, 1985. Casso would later denounce Gotti's actions to Carlo as the beginning of the end of our thing. As Casso had warned, Lucchese boss Anthony Corallo and Genovese boss Vincent Giganti decided to kill Gotti, DeChico, and every other conspirator in the Castellano murder. Amuso and Casso were chosen to handle the assassinations and were instructed to use a car bomb to try and shift suspicion to the Sicilian mobsters, or Zips, related to Castellano. While New York City mafiosi had long been banned from using bombs due to the risk of collateral damage, Sicilian mafiosi and members of the Cleveland crime family were notorious for blowing up their targets. Amuso and Casso made one attempt on the lives of Gotti and DeChico, planning a bomb in DeChico's car when the two were scheduled to visit a social club on April 13, 1986. Gotti canceled at the last minute, however, and the bomb instead only killed DeChico and injured a passenger they had mistaken for Gotti. In November 1986, Lucchese family boss Anthony Corallo sensed that the commission trial would result in a guilty verdict that would ensure the entire Lucchese leadership would die in prison. Corallo, wanting to maintain the family's half-century tradition of seamless transfer of power, called both Casso and Amuso to Fenari's Staten Island home. Casso turned down the promotion to boss and instead suggested that Amuso become the new boss. 
Amuso formally took over the family in 1987, and Casso succeeded Fernari as consigliere. Casso later took over as underboss in 1989 after Mariano Manacuso retired. While at the top of the Lucchese family, Amuso and Casso shared huge profits from their family's illegal activities. These profits included $15,000 to $20,000 a month from extorting Long Island carding companies, $75,000 a month in kickbacks from eight air freight carriers that guaranteed them labor peace and no union benefits for their workers, $20,000 a week in profits from illegal video game machines, and $245,000 annually from a major concrete supplier. Amuso and Casso also split more than $200,000 per year from the garment district rackets, as well as a cut of all crimes committed by the family's soldiers. In one instance, Casso and Amuso split $800,000 from the Colombo family for Casso's aid in helping them rob steel from a construction site at the West Side Highway in Manhattan. In another instance, the two bosses received $600,000 from the Gambino family for allowing them to take over a Lucchese protected contractor for a housing complex project on Coney Island. In 1988, Capo regime Paul Vario died in federal prison, and Amuso promoted Alphonse Diarco to Capo the Vario crew. In 1990, Amuso selected Diarco to organize a Lucchese construction panel, a committee of Lucchese family members. The panel would oversee the Lucchese-controlled unions and construction companies and coordinate joint business ventures with the other five families. Many years later, Diarco explained his role under Amuso and Casso's leadership of the Lucchese family. When a job needed to be done, whenever they needed to do something unpleasant to someone, I was the prick chosen by them. In January 1991, Casso received an early warning from a secret law enforcement source he referred to as his crystal ball about an upcoming federal indictment. Shortly before he and Amuso both went into hiding, Casso summoned Alphonse D'Arco, the capo regime of the Vario crew, to a meeting at John Paul Jones Park in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. Castle gave Diarco a list of phone booth numbers and secret addresses and informed Diarco that he was in charge of the Lucchese crime family until further notice. Diarco would meet with Castle and Amuso twice in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and several times at safe houses in Brooklyn. In early 1991, Amuso and Casso ordered the murder of Capo regime Peter Chiodo, a fellow Windows case defendant who had pleaded guilty without asking their permission. Casso assigned the murder to acting boss Alphonse Little Al Diarco. The order shocked Diarco, who knew that Chiodo had been a close friend and confidant of Casso for years. On May 8, 1991, two Lucchese shooters ambushed Chiodo while he was working on a car at a gas station in Staten Island. Chiodo received 12 bullet wounds in the arms, legs, and torso, but survived the attack. Doctors credited Chiodo's obesity with saving his life. However, he suffered several abdominal wounds and a disabled right arm. Following the unsuccessful assassination attempt, Casso delivered a blunt threat through Chiodo's lawyer that, if Chiodo testified, his wife would be murdered. Casso's threat was a violation of the long-standing American Mafia rule against killing mobsters' relatives who were not involved in the life. While Chiodo had angrily refused every previous offer to flip, Casso's threat to kill his wife was the last straw. He broke his blood oath and became a government witness, by his own account, to protect his family. Meanwhile, Diarco knew that Amuso and Caso blamed him for having failed to murder Peter Chioda and grew certain that they were planning to kill him. In July 1991, in a Staten Island meeting, Amuso and Caso replaced Diarco's acting boss with a four-man panel of Capos. While Diarco was named to this panel, he remained certain that Amuso and Caso no longer trusted him. On July 29, 1991, due to a tip-off from an unidentified Lucchese insider, Amuso was arrested and Caso secured the de facto boss of the family. It had been speculated that Caso himself was the source for the leak, as only a few people were privy to Amuso's location. This theory is contradicted, however, by Carlo, who states that Caso had no desire to be the boss of the family and attempted to arrange for Amuso's escape from federal custody after his arrest. To the disappointment of Caso and the Lucchese Capos, Amuso refused to leave prison out of fear for his life. As a result, the Lucchese Capos asked Caso to take over as acting boss. Caso reluctantly accepted. By September 21st, 1991, Alphonse Diarco was certain that Amuso and Caso had marked him and his family for death. That afternoon, Diarco telephoned the suburban Connecticut home of FBI agent Robert Marston. Diarco explained that his life was in danger and that the Lucchese family had started killing the entire families of suspected informers, which had never previously been allowed. 
After some hesitation, Diarco finally told Agent Marston that he and his family were in hiding at his mother's house in Long Island. Later that night, Diarco and his family entered Witsack. The defections of both Diarco and Chiodo opened the door for new murder indictments against Muzo and Casso. In a further violation of the Mafia's code, Chiodo's extended family in Brooklyn soon suffered retaliation from Amuso and Casso. On March 10, 1992, Lucchese enforcer Michael Spinelli shot at Chiodo's sister, Patricia Capizzolo, while she was driving in Bensonhurst. Capizzolo suffered bullet wounds in the arm, back, and neck, but survived. Meanwhile, investigators from the Brooklyn DA's office were using new technology to trace the location of cell phones. Frank Lasterino, they found, was regularly calling a cell phone near Bud Lake, New Jersey. The DA's office informed FBI agent Richard Rudolph, who had arranged for a federal warrant allowing Lasterino's phone to be tapped. As FBI agents listened in, they recognized Casso's voice. On January 19, 1993, Casso was arrested while coming out of the shower at the house he shared with his mistress in Mount Olive, New Jersey. As FBI agents searched the house, they found a rifle, $340,000 in cash, a stack of FBI reports that had been provided to Amuso's defense attorneys, and meticulous paperwork about the inner workings of the Lucchese family. The paperwork included monthly tabulations of how much money Casso and Amuso had received from each of their criminal operations. Casso had also written down a detailed list of the Christmas tribute money he and Amuso had received from each Lucchese crew. There was also a neatly typed list of proposed made men, which was disguised as a list of wedding guests. Casso was held at New York's Metropolitan Correctional Center pending trial. Facing charges that would have all but assured he would die in prison, he continued ordering hits outside, but also began making escape plans. One plan almost succeeded when a bribed guard cleared him through security. Casso nearly walked out of jail, but was spotted by another guard and thwarted at the last minute. Afterwards, Casso began making plans for Lucchese members to find out what prison buses would be transporting him and arrange an ambush, as well as assassinating the presiding judge, Eugene Nickerson, to buy himself more time. However, Casso's power came undone when Amuso not only stripped Casso of his title of underboss, but declared that all Lucchese mafiosi should consider him a pariah, in effect, banishing Casso from the family. Amuso had long been suspicious of Casso's failure to use his law enforcement contacts to find out who betrayed him, and finally concluded Casco did it himself to take control of the family. Facing the prospect of a trial at which Diarco and Chiodo were both due to star as witnesses against him, as well as spending the rest of his life in prison, Casso reached out to FBI agent Richard Rudolph and offered to turn informant. Casso was immediately moved to the federal prison at Latuna near El Paso, Texas, and housed in the famous Valachi suite as he debriefed. At the beginning of the first session, Casso joked, Every time I stepped out of the house, I committed a crime. You expect me to remember all of them? The agents urged Casso to start by revealing his crystal ball. In response, Casso disclosed that decorated NYPD detectives Stephen Caracappa and Louis Eppolito had been on his payroll and had committed eight murders under his orders. Casso further explained that detectives Caracappa and Eppolito, who had also served on the Federal Organized Crime Strike Task Force, had also leaked the names of both police and FBI informants, which had resulted in many other murders. Federal prosecutors Charles Rose and Gregory O'Connell flew from New York City to Texas as the debriefing continued. Casso named scores of other mobsters he had conspired with, including Genevieve's boss, Vincent Giganti. Casso also confessed to having sent Hitman to federal prosecutor Charles Rose's home with the intention of having him murdered. Casso also admitted to having plotted the assassination of federal judge Nickerson in order to delay his own trial. Casso initially confessed to 12 murders, but when pressed for details, he admitted to a further 24. At the same time, though, Casso was found to have lied about how much money he possessed. He also denied all involvement in the murder of Peter Chiodo's uncle or in the arson at the home of Chiodo's elderly grandmother. Increasingly skeptical, FBI agents made Casso take a lie detector test, which he failed. Casso finalized a plea agreement at a hearing on March 1, 1994, where he pleaded guilty to 70 crimes, including racketeering, extortion, and 15 murders. The two lead prosecutors on the case, Charles Rose and Gregory O'Connell, later said they feared Casso would be acquitted at trial since they did not have any taped conversation as evidence. While remaining in prison, Casso was placed in the witness protection program. According to Carlo, when Casso revealed that he also had an FBI agent on the payroll, prosecutors ordered him to keep quiet. 
Casso also alleges that he further enraged the U.S. government by accusing Gambino turncoat Sammy Gravano, who had denied ever having dealt in drugs, of buying large amounts of cocaine, heroin, and marijuana from Casso over two decades. However, Casso was vindicated to some extent when Gravano pleaded guilty in 2000 to operating a massive narcotics ring, which included selling ecstasy to adolescents. He was a second confessed underboss of a New York City crime family to break his blood oath and turn informer after Gambino underboss Gravano. In 1998, Casso was removed from the witness protection program after prosecutors alleged numerous infractions in 1997, including bribing guards, assaulting other inmates, and making false statements about Gravano and Diarco. Casso's attorneys tried to get Judge Frederick Block to overrule federal prosecutors in July 1998, but Block refused to do so. Shortly afterwards, Judge Block sentenced Casso to 455 years in prison without the possibility of parole, the maximum sentence permitted under sentencing guidelines. Casso later told the New York Times' organized crime reporter Selwyn Robb that, before turning informer, he had seriously considered a deal that would have allowed him the possibility of parole after just 22 years. Casso began serving his sentence at the Supermax Prison in ADX Florence in Florence, Colorado. According to the Federal Bureau of Prisons, Casso was transferred to the Federal Medical Center in Butner, North Carolina for the treatment of prostate cancer in March 2009. He was returned to ADX Florence in July 2009. In his later years, Casso had been suffering from complications related to prostate cancer, coronary disease, kidney disease, hypertension, bladder disease, and lung issues from years of smoking. On November 5th, 2020, Casso tested positive for COVID. On November 9th, he was transported to a local hospital due to respiratory distress. And on November 17th, 2020, he was put on a ventilator. His lawyers requested compassionate release, but that motion was rejected on November 28th. Soon afterwards, Casso died from respiratory complications on December 15th, 2020, at the age of 78. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more of our Mafia TV series, please like and subscribe. Until next time, forget about it.